Are you and I made in the image of some ape-like ancestor? Or are we made in the image of God? Today, Wayne Jackson continues his discussion of origins. Stay tuned. The Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the good divine by inspiration here. Welcome to The Truth in Love. I'm your host, David Roper, evangelist with the Brown Trail Church of Christ, the congregation that oversees this program. Last week, Wayne Jackson of Stockton, California, began a discussion of origins, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of man. He'll be continuing that discussion in just a moment. But right now, if you haven't already done so, you'll want to let somebody know about this presentation. This is information we need to share. Delighted to be back with you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to resume our discussion on the matter of origins. In our previous broadcast, we discussed the question of the origin of the universe, and we demonstrated both scientifically and logically that the universe could not have created itself and that it is not, in fact, eternal. We were therefore irresistibly driven to the conclusion that it must have been created by a mind. And of course, we pointed out that the Bible identifies that mind as God. Then we began a discussion of the question of the origin of life. And we pointed out that so far as scientific information is concerned, all life must derive from life. And again, therefore, we are forced to the conclusion that there must be some sort of eternal life force. And again, we underscored the fact that the Bible identifies this life force as God. We want to continue our discussion today of life, the technical substance that it is, and uh, the impossibility, 
that it could somehow or another have formed itself or generated itself from inorganic or non-living substances. Our bodies are composed of thousands of cells and in these cells is a center control system known as the nucleus. And within the nucleus of the cell there are chromosomes that contain genes. And the genes are packages of a chemical substance that is known as DNA. Now that's an abbreviation for a chemical known as deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is simply called the substance of life. And it's in a coded form and it's arranged in long strands of material that are of course tightly compressed into the various genes within the cells. It has been said to show you the uh, kind of information that's involved in this chemical substance. It has been said that if you took the information in the DNA of a human being and translated it into English, it would consume 1,000 volumes of literature. Or again, if you took the DNA in a single human being and unraveled it and attached it all together, it would span our entire solar system. Again, it's a coded information that determines the heredity or what the offspring of a particular organism will look like. It's what scientists call the language of life. The DNA, for example, in a human being says, make another human being. The DNA in a mouse says, make a mouse. The DNA in a cockroach says, make a cockroach. And always the program is carried out with the greatest degree of precision. But our question today is this. Would it be theoretically possible for this complicated life substance to have started itself or to have gotten started accidentally in some fashion? I'm going to introduce testimony from a number of unbelieving, that is, atheistic writers to show you the insurmountable odds against this happening by chance. In order for me to do that, I want to go to the blackboard first of all and illustrate something about mathematics. If I were to write the number one million on the board, I would have a one with six zeros beside it. And that's not very difficult to do in terms of the space that it occupies. But suppose I wanted to abbreviate that figure so that I could condense it on my paper. There's another way in which I could write it, and it would simply be like this. I would write one zero with a little six at the top. That simply means a one followed by six zeros, or that's equal to one million. Again, for the sake of illustration, suppose I wanted to write one billion. Well, one billion is one followed by nine zeros. So to produce that in an abbreviated fashion, I would simply write one zero to the ninth power. And that's an abbreviated way that mathematicians have of um, reducing their figures so that they can put more of them on their worksheets. Now, I said that to illustrate the point that I'm about to make. Dr. Harold Morowitz of Harvard University, who is an unbeliever, who has argued very forcefully against the idea of creation, as a matter of fact, just a few years ago at the University of California, Berkeley campus, I heard Dr. Morowitz debate against the creation position. Well, he's written a book entitled Energy Flow in Biology. And in that book, he discusses the statistical possibility of life being able to accidentally start itself. And here is the figure he has given in that connection. 
He says the odds of life being able to get started accidentally are on this order. One in ten to the 340th millionth power. What does that mean? It means one followed by 340 million zeros. I suggest that it's very difficult for us to even fathom the astronomical nature of that number. Let me give you an illustration to help you see the uh, vastness of that figure. Suppose we assume that the universe is 30 billion years old. Now it is not. There is no scientific evidence for it, but I'm simply using that as an arbitrary figure. If we assume that the universe is 30 billion years old, how many seconds do you suppose that would be? If you multiply the number of seconds in a minute, times the number of minutes in a week, times the number of weeks in a year, times 30 billion. You might be surprised to learn that that only works out to about 10 to the 18th power. That is, one followed by 18 zeros. 30 billion years full of seconds? Now compare that relatively small number with this one, 10 to the 340th millionth power. And yet Professor Morowitz says these are the odds against life being able to spontaneously generate itself. Well, let me give you another figure. Most of us are familiar with Dr. Carl Sagan. Carl is sort of the late night TV talk show glamour boy. He produced a series of television programs known as Cosmos. And I've always wondered, since Carl is an atheist, why he didn't dub his series Chaos if the universe is simply a random mess that accidentally originated itself. Why call it cosmos when the word indicates that which has been arranged or ordered or designed? But be that as it may, in one of Dr. Sagan's books, he has calculated the odds of life being able to accidentally generate itself. And here is the figure which he gives. He says it's on the order of 1 to 10 to the two billionth power. And that's again one followed by two billion zeros. Why don't you try to write that down in your spare time? Do you want me to tell you how much space it would take to simply write the zeros of this figure? You would have to have six thousand books of 300 pages each just to write the zeros in that figure. And that's what Carl Sagan says are the odds against life being able to spontaneously generate itself. And yet, amazingly, he says this is precisely what we believe has happened at some point in the remote past. And so, we suggest that there is no evidence, there is no logical, there is no scientific, there is no statistical evidence that would indicate that life was able to spontaneously generate itself. Allow me, if I may, to sort of put a footnote on these statistics which I've given on the board. Dr. Emil Borel is one of the world's foremost mathematicians and statisticians. He does studies in statistics. And he has formulated what he calls a law of mathematical probability. And Dr. Borrell says that any time you have a situation in which the odds are on the order of 1 to 10 to the 50th power, that is 1 in 1 followed by 50 zeros. He says any time you have odds that great. You have a situation which cannot conceivably occur no matter how much time is involved. 
Now, if you would, compare that figure. Borel says that any time you go beyond 1 to 10 to the 50th power, you have an absolutely statistical impossibility. But compare 1 to 10 to the 50th power with 1 to 10 to the 2 billionth, or 1 to 10 to the 340 millionth. It's very easy to see that the evidence is totally against the concept of the naturalistic origin of life. But suppose we just assume for the sake of the argument that we have life here upon the earth in some form or fashion. We're not going to deal with how it got here, but now we're simply going to address ourselves to the issue of how that life was able to start from a very simple, seemingly, one-celled organism and proliferate itself, expand itself into the great variety of the world of living things. Suppose, for example, we start out with a protozoa or an amoeba, that tiny little one-celled organism that you look at through the microscope when you first take freshman biology. Beginning with that simple form of life and then going all the way up the ladder until you finally arrive at man, how did this change occur? How have we gotten from this microscopic simple form to this exceedingly complex form that we know of as man? Well, there are two basic arguments that evolutionists have employed in an attempt to explain the phenomenon or the mechanism by which these changes have occurred that have ultimately resulted in the production of man. I want to mention these two things and then let's look at them and see how they fare under the light of objective scientific knowledge. The first way to explain how organisms change and therefore become progressively complex is by a mechanism known as genetic mutations. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that we have in our cells genes, and the genes are the carriers of the hereditary information. Now, what would happen if some of that information were scrambled around or changed a little bit? Well, obviously, the organism produced would be slightly different from the parent. It's sort of like taking one of these little IBM cards that has the holes in it and running it through the computer with one of the holes stopped up or an extra hole punched in it. The information that comes out in the final analysis will be distorted. Well, as a matter of fact, we know that mutations do occur occasionally in nature. And the evolutionist assumes, therefore, that these mutations gradually build up across the centuries and they are selected by the process of natural selection so that eventually entirely new kinds of organisms can be produced. But what are the actual facts regarding mutations? Let me mention several things. First of all, mutations rarely occur. Professor C. H. Waddington, one of Great Britain's most famous scientists, has stated that mutations occur on the order of about one in a million instances. So the order of occurrence is very rare. In the second place, when mutations do occur, even evolutionists admit that in more than 99% of the instances, they are harmful. In many instances, lethal. That is, they kill the organism or they damage it, retard it severely in some fashion. In fact, Professor H.J. Muller, who was affiliated with the University of California Davis campus, has made the statement that most mutations are so damaging, he said, in fact, that we may actually consider them as all being very negative influences. So they rarely occur. They are generally damaging, probably always damaging. And in the third place, a mutation is only able to change the information that is already there. It cannot create a new kind of organism. Rather, it can only scramble the information that is already present in the first place. 
Now, since mutations are obviously such a very negative phenomenon, how can you use that as an argument to explain the progressive upward development of the alleged evolutionary process? If you're going to get an organism from a very simple state to a very complex state, you're going to have to have some mechanism that is a building up, creating positive process. But the fact of the matter is, mutations are a negative, debilitating, destroying, downgrading process. If I were an evolutionist, the last argument that I would appeal to on this earth in order to try to establish the evolutionary concept would be that of random genetic mutations. The second argument that they use to try to prove the evolution of the simple to the complex is that of natural selection. And really, we don't have to spend very much time discussing that because the evolutionists themselves are after that concept with tooth and claw these days. In fact, recently a book was published the title of which was Darwin Retried. The author of that book is Norman Macbeth, who is a Harvard-educated lawyer, and as a matter of fact, on the side, a specialist in evolutionary matters. And Professor Macbeth has stated that the concept of natural selection is no longer considered credible. It is a thoroughly discredited phenomenon so far as being able to progressively change an organism from the simple to the complex is concerned. And Norman Macbeth is not alone in his criticism of that particular argument. For example, just recently, Dr. Colin Patterson, who is the senior paleontologist at the, uh, one of the leading British scientific institutes, addressed a seminar of his colleagues and he began his presentation in this fashion. He said, will you tell me one single thing you know as absolute fact regarding the theory of evolution? And he went on from there to point out that what we've been doing is offering theories, conjectures, speculations, guesses, but he said we don't have one iota of real fact to nail down the evolutionary concept with. And these two gentlemen are just two of many who could be mentioned who are severely criticizing the evolutionary concept and particularly the notion of natural selection. Sir James Gray, one of Great Britain's leading scientists, said not long ago in describing the process of natural selection, he said this is the analogy that he uses to which uh, he compares it. He says, natural selection is really the theory that if you have an adequate number of monkeys typing on typewriters for an adequate period of time, they will eventually produce a set of encyclopedias. Now, if you believe that, I've got some swamp land down in Florida that I'd like to sell you. Seriously, folks. Evolution is in grave difficulty today. There is no mechanism known that can logically and consistently and buttressed with scientific data establish the concept that has been so much in vogue ever since Charles Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of the Species, in the year 1859. Evolution is bankrupt. And the true account of man's origin is that which is revealed in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then again, in Genesis 2, 6 or 7, Jehovah God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. You are a creature of God, and you have a responsibility to Him and you need to look in the Bible, which is His inspired revelation, to see what that responsibility is. Thank you so much for listening today. I'm pressing on the upward way, new hearts I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on high.
Our sincere thanks to Wayne Jackson for taking the time to be with us this week and last and to fortify our faith with his lessons. Now, incidentally, that's the name of a special 80-page book written by Mr. Jackson that enlarges upon the material he presented in our short series, Fortify Your Faith. You can have a free copy of this book by just sending us your name and address. We'll send out free copies as long as our supply lasts. So get a copy and share it with your friends and your neighbors and your relatives. Our featured congregation this week is the Carter Park Church of Christ that meets at 1171 Hathcox in Fort Worth. Their Sunday morning worship service is at 10 o'clock. They'd love to have you visit with them. Now until next week, may God bless you richly. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.